Hi, everyone. Welcome. My name's Naomi, and um, it has been literally one of the joys of my life to be working with Natasha Carthy for the last couple of months, um, putting on uh, this Working Class Writers' Festival. And it is so wonderful, if slightly surreal, to actually see you all in person with legs in the room. Uh, so do um, bear with us if we both get a little bit giddy with excitement, because we haven't done too many of these in-person things for a while. Um, uh, thank you uh, for all of you for joining us tonight and for joining us um, at the end of another busy day of Working Class Writers Festival. Uh, we are now two thirds of the way through and we have another packed day tomorrow. So I look forward to hopefully seeing you um, again tomorrow. A couple of little um, bits of um, housekeeping first um, before we start. Um, do feel free to um, take photos, to be tweeting along, to be sharing with us um, everything that you're, that you're thinking. Uh, we're in for a real, real treat um, tonight. Um, so tonight we are really, really blessed to have Terry and Cash with us. Now I know you might be thinking, hang on a minute, there's only one other person on stage with you, um, and I'm so delighted to be sat next to Terry um, here. And by the wonders of modern technology, I can now do the sprinkle of the dust. And yay! That actually works. There we go. Cash, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. Can we just pop the volume up just a little bit on Cash? Cash Lovely to see you. You, you both look gorgeous. Fire. I'm sorry that everyone's having to see my big COVID face. <laughs> I love the fact that it feels like we're about to be told a story around Jack and Nori or something with that roaring fire in the background. Um, yeah, it's a, real, it's a real joy. So I'm really just going to um, sit here and listen to you guys chat. Uh, and every now and again, I'm going to sort of jump in and, and ask a couple of questions. There will be time at the end um, for Q&A as well um, for both Terry and Cash. Um, and um, I'm actually not going to do too much more about um, uh, talking about who these amazing women are, because A, they can tell you themselves, and also because I just want to get on with hearing, hearing you guys talk. So perhaps, perhaps um, Terry, let's start, let's start with you firstly. Um, just as a little bit of introduction, tell us all who you are and also what it means to be here today talking about misery porn and how we get beyond that awful title. Yeah, and we should say it's misery porn. Misery, misery porn. Uh, yeah, so I'm uh, Terry White. I wrote this book, um, Coming Undone. Um, so I've been a journalist for 21 years. Um, I come from a working class background. Um, and I published my memoir in the middle of lockdown. Um, and it's about my childhood, growing up in poverty, about the sexual abuse and violence, physical violence um, in our house growing up and kind of how that um, affected my sense of self, my womanhood, and then I'm, I'm kind of praising here, but then how I ended up in a like, locked psychiatric ward in New York. I jumped quite a bit in the middle there, but it was, it was essentially, you know, really focusing on, on what happened in New York. I overdosed on um, pills and alcohol after struggling with my mental health for years and tracing that back, I suppose, um, to my childhood and what was really important for me in the book. And, the, and let's just get one thing out of the way now, which is the term misery memoir makes me fuck... Can I say fucking? Okay. Say whatever you like, Terry. Makes me fucking raging, quite frankly. Um, and me and Cash have talked about this before and we'll get into it, but the way that it's used to diminish us and our stories, the way that it's used to reduce us to essentially the content of our stories, the way it dehumanises us, all of these things I think are really important. But what was important for me in the book was to be incredibly honest about my experiences, to not care about palatability, to not care about um, making it okay and comfortable for people to read. That wasn't my job. My job was to, to tell the truth. And fundamentally, you know, I, I write in the beginning of the book, I dedicated it to the girls who um, feared they'd be forever lost. When I was growing up, I was told quite a few times that I would never be anything, that I would never be anyone, that I would always be lost. And I think for years, I felt like because of where I'd come from and because of what had happened, that I would always be lost, that I'd never find my way back to myself. And I did. And I think um, I wanted to speak to those girls who were like me, and I remember thinking that I was the only girl in the world going through this, that I was the only girl in the world who felt violated and isolated 
and entirely disposable. And I hoped that just by writing the book, I'd be able to reach out to either the girls who were going through it themselves or the women that they'd become. Um, I can't remember what the question was, but basically, <laughs> uh, that's a bit about the book and a bit about me. And, oh yes, why it's important to be here, because um, I think often at festivals, you'll see there'll be like a working class slot or a slot for working class women. Um, I think that actually being in a room with people, with writers, who there's a sense of recognition, there's a sense of your experiences, not necessarily being mirrored in the exact same, but we have a commonality, um, we have shared concerns, um, we often are searching for truth, we're searching for authenticity, and just being in a room where we can talk about this stuff openly and honestly and have really interesting conversations, um, I find incredibly, incredibly exciting, and I think this is an incredible, incredible festival, and I'm very excited to be here. Thank you. And that's definitely what we've sort of tried to, to seek to do, is to create that, that safe space. And it's been really powerful this week. You know, we've had tears in some sessions, we've had laughter, we've had everything in between. Um, and that's definitely what we want to, to create with that space. And hopefully you're getting a, a sense of that vibe as well, Cash, um, even though you're, you're kind of getting it through, through the airwaves. Yeah. yeah, I so wish I could be there. Just to be in the room with like other working class writers. As Terry said, it's so rare. Because as you said, you are the one person on the pa on the panel, and you feel like an outsider. So I imagine it just feels just like beautiful and inclusive there. So um, yeah, it's a shame that I can't be there. Um, I wrote a book called Skin Estate, um, and I was a failed writer for twenty years before that. And um, I don't think that <laughs> I didn't want to write a memoir. I didn't ever have any interest in in becoming a memoir writer. I was writing fiction and for theatre for, um, for those 20 failed years. And I was kind of forced into writing a memoir. And I was in a very desperate situation when I took the book deal. Um, I don't consider Skin Estate to be misery porn. I think it's only middle class people that would think that. I think, I think Skin Estate is a really funny look at what it is to have ambition and to suffer loneliness whilst living in poverty. I don't think it's um, political in the sense that it's trying to be, um, trying to make change. That's something that the, we'll get into it, it, it deeper when we talk, Terry, but you know, that's something that the publishers kind of put on the book. Um, but, but yeah, I want, as a working class woman, of course I want to write about the working class experience because, um, all, all writers write about what they know, regardless of what genre they're working within. And um, yeah, so I just wanted to, I want to tell stories about working class women. And I, it just so happened that I was forced <laughs> into telling my own. And I, feel, I do feel, I feel exposed here on the screen. I feel exposed as a writer because I've had to give so much of myself. So the pornography um, aspect comes from being violated by the publishing industry as opposed to uh, the way that the story is perceived, I think. There's so much there to unpack that we're gonna uh, we're gonna sort of tease out a little bit. And it was that it's that point that you just said, Cash, about this word memoir. Firstly, because I know having spoken to a couple of people this week that memoir is one of those words that makes people feel a bit icky somehow and a bit uncomfortable. And and also it's so often associated with, let's be frank mediocre middle-aged white men uh, and they're kind of great tomes and they're you know jo jeremy clarkson's got yet another one out as though he's got something to say so i was wondering <laughs> about i was wondering about how how you both related to this word memoir and 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 the relationship to a word that's kind of been put onto you and onto your writing do you consider yourselves memoirists has your idea of what a memoir means changed What's your, what's your relationship? Cash, let's start with you. Um, I think writing a memoir as a working class woman whilst living in poverty is an incredibly dangerous thing to do. And because I didn't write Skin Estate in hindsight, it wasn't from my nice house having success and then writing about this sad period in my life. I wrote it actually whilst living in completely desperate circumstances whilst an active alcoholic, um, suicidal, um, you know, just, 
I, I wrote it in the moment. So there was no way to look at it in hindsight. Um, so <laughs> the word memoir, uh, do, for me, it just feels very dangerous and very exposing and just very like, like I've been violated in some way. Um, and of course, like you would think that it's um, a choice, that it was a, like, a, it's a choice to write a memoir. And I think for many people it is. And I think, I think for Terry, perhaps it was because she'd had this long career and, and, and wanted to say something. But for me, it was like a, a route in to be in something and I had no other choice but to do it. So memoir doesn't feel like a friendly way to write. It doesn't feel like a nice thing to be doing. Um, I don't know. What do you think, Terry? Are you, your, your, your views are very different. I imagine I just, uh, I just, think, I just think it's. Oh, well, all I know is that I was put in a lot of danger by writing it, and the way that I've been perceived since is because of that. That memoir, like I'm kind of stuck. If that makes sense. But I think that that context's really important because I think what Cash is describing as, as that's her story. And for me, memoir is, is, is just kind of means a true story. I don't really have a problem with the term. I have a problem with the perception of the word. So I think especially memoir by women is not considered literary. Memoir by working class women certainly isn't fucking considered literary, especially if it deals with abuse, if it deals with violence, if it deals with anything that is unpalatable, that's where the misery memoir term comes from. We were talking about this earlier. Some people don't see the difference between this and between a story and take a break, for example, because all it is is the shocking tale of X, Y, and Z. They don't see it as art. They don't see it as something you've crafted. They're not interested in the craft or any of that. Um, but I think what Cash is describing is really important because there absolutely is a safety in writing memoir when you've been removed or have removed yourself from the situation. So when I wrote it, and I had a compulsion to write it when I came out of the psych ward. Um, I was in AA and outpatient rehab, living in New York, and I was trying not to go to bars and restaurants. Um, and when you stop drinking, you realize how long the nights are. Like, there's hours and hours and hours you've got to fill. And a friend said to me, just write these 50-word stories about your time in the psych ward to try and kind of capture it. And as I wrote these things, I just had this compulsion to write. And I started writing what I thought was a book about New York. But actually, this childhood stuff kept coming out. And I kind of hate this because it sounds pretentious, but it, it almost took over me. I don't remember writing some of it. I just sat down to write, and it like kind of just came out and landed on the page. But I was in a place of safety, let's be clear. So I was in a good job. I edited a magazine in New York. I had financial security. That was entirely my choice, and, and that narrative was mine to own. And what Cash is describing is something very different, which is that wasn't fully her choice. But I think, actually, what makes Cash's book so powerful, and we know each other because I read Skin Estate and basically found her on Twitter and DM'd her going, holy shit, I have never seen anything like my experience reflected in a book like that, it just knocked me for six. I was just obsessed with this book. There is a power in Cash's book which comes from her writing it while sat in that experience because what we are used to is we will allow you to be a storyteller because you're now middle class, because you've got yourself into a different position, because you have been redeemed, because you've been through this three-act thing where you can look back on these sad days you are acceptable to be able to tell your story. It's very rare for somebody still in that situation to be given the platform. And, and maybe in this case, actually, you know, that wasn't fully within Cash's control. But I think part of the sheer kind of visceral power of Skin Estate is because that's where she wrote it from. Mm, yeah, I mean, I... What I struggled with was... So, sorry to interrupt. Um, was, was the fact that um, I wasn't allowed to be an artist. Yeah. It was almost like I wasn't really allowed to call myself a writer because I was like someone from Take a Break magazine. And a lot of the times, if you see like middle class people will do a memoir and they'll get the opportunity to write lots of think pieces in broadsheets about what brought them to write that memoir, how it happened. And, you know, there'd be some really interesting pieces that they can write. <laughs> when my book came out, I got a request, or my agent got a request, from woman's own, um, would, would Cash like us to tell her story? 
I mean, my book had just come out. You know, I mean, my book was on the shelves. You know, it was, it was reviewed quite well. But women's magazines, I was still the fodder of Take a Break magazine and Chat magazine and Woman's Own. And I was just someone who had got lucky. Like, I wasn't an artist who had toiled over these words and constructed this story in this way that I wanted to tell it. I was someone who was just spewing up on a page and was saying, please listen to me, please help me, which wasn't the case at all because, you know, a lot of my favourite writers, Bukowski, uh, Hubert Sylvie Jr., they write from the gutter. So in my mind, when I was writing it, it's like I was writing from the gutter. I wasn't writing as a piece of trash in the gutter, which was how I was perceived by the press. Yeah, I mean, that's... Um, and it just shows, I think, that whole conversation about how... just how radical what both of you have done is and, and actually how radical it is to, 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 to show a whole, full, um, visceral experience of what it means to be a working-class woman. It's it's not just, you know, here's, here's all of the shocking stuff. It's not here's just the kind of the confessional, but actually to, as you've both done with your books, to to show everything that it means to be a working-class woman and to, to hold your own and to own your story within that space. And, and it feels radical reading it off the page, um, which is, yeah, which is just incredible. Cash, how did you, how did you feel... Did, did you feel and how did you feel safe and supported in the in the writing of it and how what what lessons I suppose can we learn for other women to say look your story is important how, 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 how would you how would you give some advice to someone in your position who's got that story to tell now what yeah. would you have loved someone well, to I was I was very you? safe when I was writing it I was living in my council flat I was medicated by alcohol um, I knew that I was a poor woman. Like, I knew that's what I was. I was a poor woman who was writing, try, in my mind, writing my way out of it because this book was going to bring me huge success and take me out of the gutter. That's, that's, that's how I kept myself safe when I was writing it. I think the jeopardy arrived upon publication. Um, and if I could go back... I mean, it's difficult for me because without that memoir, I wouldn't have the career that I have now, which is very lovely. I write for TV and I make films. And, you know, that is um, a really lovely position to be in. But when that book came out, I was completely exposed. And, and it, was, it was gatekeepers. It was, it was gatekeeping that kind of really made life very, very difficult. So I would, I would say, be really clear on what you want to write. Like when you're, when you're working with publishers, be honest, because perhaps I was dishonest, you know, when I was saying, do you want to write a memoir? I'm like, yes, yes, because I, I could see that as my only escape, my only way to ever get published, because no one was publishing my fiction. No one, uh, plays don't make very much money. So I would say be really honest with your publisher. And if you don't want to publish memoir, then don't do it, because it, can, it, will, it will only lead to trouble. Oh, God, that sounds awful. <laughs> Oh my god, no, it's because I'm not there. If I was there, you'd you'd get a real sense of what I was I'm saying. It sounds all very like dark and dramatic, doesn't it? But I just I just I think it's really important to be protected by your publisher. And I think because um when I wrote it, I I thought I could approach it in the same way that um I felt I don't know, I just felt protected and and it's it's a very did you feel protected, Terry? Um I did, but it's interesting what you say because I think you have to be clear that you will write when memoir and what you will reveal because Cash is right. Once it's out there, you can't control what is then done by that information. So I remember having an entire meeting with my publisher about uh, what do we do if my mum goes to the press and disputes stuff in the book that I, is, I know true, but what if that happens? And, and what if my dad suddenly objects to it? And what if the man who abused me is identifiable and he claims he didn't abuse me. How can I prove, because I was abused by two different men, one went to prison, one didn't. How can I prove the man who didn't go to prison abused me? It was one question I was asked, how can I prove that? Mm. Because I didn't report, my mum didn't report it to the police. Mm. Um, and I was like, I don't, know what to I don't know what to tell you apart from I was a child and I didn't imagine that I would be sat here you know, 30 years later, having to give somebody proof of the fact 
mm. that I was violated when I was seven years old. That wasn't ever on my kind of mind. But these are the conversations you have to have, and I found it incredibly difficult. When the, and, you know, the publishers are doing their job, and it's, it's, they have to be protected legally. They're working with their lawyers. But somebody will ring you up and say, we're not sure you can publish this because we can't verify it. And obviously, in, in allegations of sexual abuse, that's very common that you haven't got you know, an eyewitness or a conviction. I mean, we all know what the conviction rates in this country are like. It's actually very rare to have a conviction. And you have somebody saying, well, you know, we believe you, but you can't prove it so other people won't. And that's incredibly difficult when you have been the victim of violence and sexual violence to be as an adult, when you think you're in control of your story, having that challenged, even though it was being challenged in all the appropriate ways, if you see what I mean, because it was part of the deal, we had to publish a legally sound book. That was, I found that incredibly difficult because I felt like I was that seven-year-old girl again, not being believed mm. and, and you know, having to kind of prove it all over again. So you do have to have an emotional robustness, I suppose, and be in a good enough place that you basically can go through all of that and, and not find it too difficult but and you do have to think about what you put out there because you can't take it back once it's published and it's out there and people can comment on it on the internet newspapers can write things you can be challenged by strangers about something people can say you know i i had my book extracted in guardian weekend and a man on facebook was like uh this woman sounds like she's got daddy issues. It's like, no shit, I've got daddy issues. <laughs> You'd have fucking daddy issues. But in, in even just something like that, you have to be able to kind of take that kind of stuff. Um, and I think it's as important to know the story you don't want to tell and also how you want to tell it. So a couple of people advised me that actually the book might be taken more seriously if I paired it with something... Um, narratively that would elevate it so for example it wouldn't just be straight memoir it would be paired with nature writing or it would be paired with history or and that actually that may make it easier to publish somebody said maybe you could make it a bit more like a self-help guide I was like I mean if somebody's coming to me for self-help then they're in <laughs> loads of bother already but also I, well, I don't want to fucking write a self-help guide what you're talking about I want to write a memoir a, a, a memoir that is full, hopefully, of beautiful writing. That's what I wanted to write. And you have to be quite firm on that. And I can remember just thinking, when is an interior... Like, that's all I wanted to tell, is the interior life of a working-class woman. Why isn't that on its own enough? Mm. Why is a story of my interior life not seen as good enough to be able to publish an entire book on? And I felt very strongly about that, and I would rather have not published the book than to compromise on that and to reshape it to make it, I don't know, more commercial, more palatable, um, more acceptable to a wider audience. Mm. Um, so I think you have to have a real sense of exactly what your boundaries are, exactly how you want to be published, and more to the point, exactly what you don't want. Because mm. you can't, you get to, I always think you get to tell your story largely once, and you have to be really mm. sure that you're telling it in the way mm. that you want to tell it. I think there are probably a couple of words which are resonating, potentially particularly with women in the room at the minute. One which is the phrase, taken more seriously, and the other one is being believed. Yeah. And it just, again, sort of resounds the fact that this is such a radical thing that you're both doing. Cash, how, do, how do, they, do those words chime with you? That idea of, you know, being taken more seriously, you would be taken more seriously if you were going to do this, or that idea of having to fight to be believed. Yeah, totally. I mean... Because I had a book deal with Penguin, I, I thought I would be taken seriously. I mean, that was my biggest mistake. I thought, well, I've got this book deal, I, I will be taken seriously and I will be believed. And actually, um, you know, I was most definitely not believed at all. I was investigated by The Guardian for um, literary fraud within the, I mean, the book had been out. The, actually, <laughs> can I tell the story, Terry? Have I mentioned it to you before? Oh, yeah, tell the story. I tell, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's, I'm following on from my theme of being very depressing this evening, so I might <laughs> as well go on with that. Um, I was up in... Um, it was the day before the book came out, and I was um, up in Manchester because I was going to go on BBC Breakfast News the following morning to promote the book. And um, as we got into Manchester, we got a phone call, the publicist got a phone call 
Um, no, sorry, oh, that's not true. I got a text message from a journalist who's a friend of mine saying the Guardian are going to run a hit piece on you. Um, they, they don't believe that the book is real. They don't believe you're working class. They don't believe you, that you're living in poverty. And this, this article is going to expose you. And I was like, what the fuck? You know, I'm <laughs> at the time I was living on a council estate. I was, I mean, there was no doubt that I was living in poverty. I had the receipts. And I was in the Holiday Inn on, in uh, Salford Keys, uh, just thinking, shit, my life is over. You know, the one thing, this one book that I've written, which is the absolute horrific truth and makes me look horrendous in every way. And, you know, I've written things in there that people would never be able to forgive me for, things that I can never even forgive myself for. And it's, being, it's going to be declared as a lie. Um, for thousands of people to see, you know, how will I ever live such a thing down? And I, you know, I just, I honestly thought tonight's the, the night I'm going to die. And um, I got a, a tweet from Terry <laughs> saying that she read the book and just knowing that she believed it sort of turned everything around, you know, it kind of gave me hope because it's like, okay, this, these middle class people are going to disbelieve it because they disbelieve us all the time. But this, this woman who I respect has just tweeted me and said that she understood the book and it meant so much to be believed by her. So um, believability, you know, being believed is, <laughs> means so much to me. I mean, you write a memoir because you're telling the truth, right? That's the one thing, that's the one thing you have is the truth of your words. Regardless if everyone thinks that you're a shit writer, they don't enjoy the story, whatever, you have, have told a story in your way and it's you. It's 100% you and you've put yourself out there completely exposed and unmasked. Um, and then to not be believed is just absolutely horrific. But I think that's, that's just to do with being working class uh, and being a woman. Working class women are rarely believed. If you look at the benefit system, when you're on benefits, you're constantly being made to prove that you are as poor as you say you are. So it's understandable, not acceptable, but understandable that a national newspaper would disbelieve working class stories. Terry, did, did, uh, <laughs> Terry, <laughs> Terry, did you feel any of that resonance when you sent that tweet to Cash? Yeah, and it, you know when I she told me this afterwards about this piece, and I just find it extraordinary the lengths that people will go to because they don't want to face the truth of what we're saying. Does it make you so uncomfortable about the country we live in and the way some people in this country have to live that you presume we're being dishonest, like because you can't face that truth, and because, as Cash said, we, we're not only women, but we're working class women. So therefore, there's already, to their mind, a credibility issue. Um, and I, th I think believability is incredibly, incredibly important because all, all we have is our stories. It's what connects us. It's what connected me to Cash. It's what connects everybody in this room. Our shared stories, our shared experiences, it's how we feel like we're part of something bigger. It's how we feel understood. It's how I try and know my place in the world um, and to try and make sense of it. So when that's kind of threatened and challenged and called into question, that is incredibly, incredibly difficult to be able to kind of accept and live with. And maybe some people would prefer to say, oh, it can't be, possibly be true. You have to be lying. I remember somebody made a comment about my book, which is, oh, and then, God, another terrible thing happened. Why, why were they always happening to you? And I was like, would you like me to tell you about revictimization and why predators often go after people who've been abused before? Like, there, there are, if you, if you chose to actually, you know, read something, then you might actually learn the truth of, of what being in poverty means and what violence within poverty to, can mean and how sexual abuse works and how predators work, all of these things. And so I just think it's a complete refusal to want to, to see those those parts of society and our experiences that make them mm. uncomfortable. And I suppose... Not only that, Terry, but I was also thinking that it's also about um, not wanting 
you to be artistic, you know, not to be able to use it for artistic expression because we are considered like sad, like sad specimens. So it's okay for us to tell a very, very sad story and, you know, to be patted on the head and called brave and say, oh, it must be really cathartic for you to tell that story. But if you were to kind of mould it into something artistic, something entertaining, then it's, it's suddenly considered a lie. Like, for example, I think that my book was purposefully entertaining and purposefully funny and yes there were sad parts to it but overriding that was a real swagger about you know saying fuck you this is this is a I'm going to tell this story in a way that's almost like um where I kind of place myself as the anti-hero and you know to for someone to do that it's such a brazen act that they could they couldn't possibly believe that it's true because I'm not conforming to the, you know, oh, thank you for the opportunity mm. to write this book. Thank you. It's so nice of you to let me speak, you know, and I'm going to tell my story in a very sad way. And if you don't do that, then your believability is kind of thrown out the window, perhaps. And Brave, I mean, we talked about this book, Brave. I mean, mm. if just next time you're reading a review of a memoir, by, especially by a woman, see how many times... I mean, if you can find a review of a memoir written by a woman. <laughs> but if you find one... The, the amount of times that we're praised for our bravery, and I know people may mean well when they say that, but we don't want to hear that we're brave. We want, to, for, we want the work to be taken seriously and to be appraised as such. It isn't about kind of the, the emotional kind of journey we have to go on to publish the book. That isn't what it's about. It's about what we've created and what we've made and how that's them received and I personally think all of that kind of you know rhetoric around bravery and I think it's it's patronizing and it's it's part of kind of keeping us in our box really it's incredibly incredibly patronizing and reductive and and you know you feeling that wow you've you've gone and shared the most awful experiences of your life with loads of people as opposed to what Kasha's saying which is you've used that and you've created mm. something hopefully powerful and beautiful and affecting I wondered if I could um, ask you both about uh, the idea of responsibility, which might come from others, but also might come from yourself, about sometimes now needing to either be forced to be or having to be seen as spokesperson, kind of spokespeople for topics that you've covered, and whether there's whether you feel that sense both from kind of outside, if people go, oh, and, oh yeah, Terry's written about some of this stuff, let's, let's get her opinion on it, that's kind of sometimes forced from outside, but also your own inner sense of, actually, I also need to... I want to be there telling that story. Is that something that you've both grappled with? If you want to go, Terry, you go first. No, you go first. You're brilliant on this. Go on. Well, oh God. I, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not an activist. Uh, I don't want to be an activist. Um, being asked to speak for others is just a ridiculous thing. I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a politician. Um, I, I get a lot of, my agent gets a lot of calls from Sky News, whenever Marcus Rashford is in the press, um, does Cash want to come on and talk about what it's like living with her child in poverty? And I'm like, well, why are you calling on me for that? I wrote a book two years ago about it. You know, life has moved on since. And also, what would, what would make me the spokesperson for all women who... Um, are living in poverty anyway. I mean, it's just it's just a ridiculous concept. It's it, again, it's to to, to diminish the artist to say you are you are nothing but an activist. You're nothing but a spokesperson. I I have nothing to say for anyone, and that really offends people. I don't, you know, uh, yeah, working class women. Are, there isn't one working class voice who must represent us all. You know, uh, it's, yeah, it's ridiculous. It makes me very angry. Terry, have you got anything you want to say to that? I mean, just the same, really. I, I, I will often get asked by certain newspapers who may contribute to some of the unhealthiest discourse around poverty in this country who want me to write for them about growing up in poverty, um, which obviously I don't do. But I, 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 try and, I try and, if I can, you know, I work with Refuge and with the NSPCC and try and do a little bit of whatever I can to kind of, you know, help some of the services that helped me, we um, used refuge when I was growing up. We stayed in a, a refuge for a couple of months and um, uh, I ch called Childline once. So the services I engaged with, I think I feel some sense of, you know, trying to do something um, to reciprocate because 
refuge especially helped us in a very, very, very dire, dangerous situation. Um, and, you know, and, and the publishers warned me when the book came out that I'd probably hear from a lot of women who had been through similar things. And I did. And that was very affecting, really, because I think often those women would want to hear that everything was great now, mm -hmm. that, like, um, you know, I, I have a child now and I have a boyfriend and I, none of that is in the book and I don't end, there's no happy ending in the book. Um, I didn't want to conform to that three-act structure because I think that whole redemption narrative, especially when you're dealing with mental health and lifelong trauma, mm. is incredibly dangerous and just untrue. And so I really resisted that, but, you know, people often get in touch with me and say, you know, your book didn't have a ending. Can you tell me you're, you're all right? And I, I've seen on your Instagram you've got a baby and they kind of want that sense of closure for me and, and redemption for me and, and that being something that they could mm. reach for as well. And that's the responsibility I feel uncomfortable with because, you know, the, the trauma doesn't go away. You learn to live with it and you learn to sit alongside it. My mental health issues will be with me my entire life. And I would never... And actually, I feel like the bigger responsibility is not presenting an incredibly simplistic, naive version of recovery and, you know... I, I left behind poverty and I left behind abusive situations and then I, you know, and everybody loves the fact you've had a baby. It's like, wow, you've had a baby, amazing. You must be a healed human being. It's like I haven't slept in two <laughs> years. Like, if anybody thinks having a baby is going to kind of fix their mental health, yeah, it doesn't. But, um, but yes, yeah, so I think that's a bigger, almost as big a, if not a bigger responsibility um, is actually not presenting a incredibly false representation that then people can't live up to. I used to read memoirs that were like, and then had a baby and, you know, live in Ohio on a farm. And I'd be like, I'm never going to live in Ohio on a farm. I'm never going to have a baby. I'm still fucked, you know. And that, that would actually make me feel more desperate and more kind of far away from where I wanted to be. So I think the, re the keeping the realism and, and the truth at the forefront is really important to me. It is, though, really hard to, to kind of take on that responsibility as well because it's not like you have the answers. Because no. you wrote a book about your own experiences or your own opinions, like, it, you, you don't have the answer. So, if, so, you know, someone says, what is, how do you solve child poverty? I don't know because all I did was write about some things that happened to me. And it is really uncomfortable when, you know, people do feel like they can offload their experiences to you it's 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 quite damaging and I know and you know you put yourself out there so you know you're presenting yourself as you know someone who's gone through this but then when someone actually comes up to you and shares those experience whether it be a dm on twitter or you know at an event or something it's really really quite hard to deal with I think um, I don't want to leave questions to the end. Um, I want to sort of make sure that this is as much a kind of conversation and dialogue. So um, is there, are there any questions from the audience at, at this point? With, they, as you can tell, there is still so much more that we can, we can talk about, but I didn't want to sort of feel as though questions were just being left to the end and there, were, there was an energy that was saying, actually, I've got something to say. And it doesn't even need to be a question. It could just be a response if there's anyone that wants to say anything at this point. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I think that's one of the things, just picking up on your point that you've just made, is um, one of the things that really makes both of these books leap off the page and sort of grab, I mean, like grab you in the face in the most beautiful, powerful way is that they're complicated. And the relief of being told a story that's complicated, and again, it just makes me think that's... I mean, it, it's sad in a way that it's radical, but it is radical to see complicated women's complicated lives. And they're not just, you know, as you say, they don't fall into that kind of three-act structure. And then at the end, you know, it all, it all happened. Um, and, yeah, I mean, that, that, that complexity is one of the things that really comes across from both of you. I suppose one of the things also is... Where, where do you go after that? Having, having kind of, you know, really, as you say, Cash, exposed yourself, how do you then, how do you then go, okay, n now what? How do, I, how do I take myself next? And how do you navigate that relationship with a publisher or an agent who might then be trying to steer you either 
in, in a certain direction or, or in another direction? Well, I went into hiding <laughs> and that I found that that was quite a useful thing uh, to not be on show. Um, and I, I was quite lucky that I got a TV deal um, a few months after the book came out. So I've been working in TV since then as a writer. And um, I find that TV is, is just so much kinder to working class writers, especially women. There's a real thirst for female stories, I think, um, in TV and film. And just the way that the publishing industry treats women is very, very different to the way the TV industry treats women. Like, I'm, I kind of have autonomy to tell the stories I want to tell when it comes to television. But with... Um, so I, I, I had another deal to write a second book, um, a prequel to um, Skin to State. And I just decided that I would hand in... I, I handed back my advance... Um, I wrote, I actually wrote the manuscript and then I just thought, it's actually a better book than Skin at State, I will say. <laughs> um, but I can say that because no one's ever going to see it. <laughs> um, but it's, um, I just handed it in because I just didn't want that kind of exposure anymore. I, I found it best to retreat. I think if you come out with a memoir, first of all, you, you have the opportunity to either continue talking about that same subject forever, because that's the only thing people will let you talk about or you can retreat and find another medium to tell those stories and that's that's where I feel safer being. And funnily enough, that was something that came up in... We had a conversation yesterday that was about the power of performance. We had a number of um, playwrights and actors who were saying a very similar thing. Once you've played a certain character or you've, you know, you, you've written a certain play or you've written a certain story, um, sometimes there is that thing of actually... You're, that, that's the train that you're then on. Um, how did you navigate some of that, Terry? Well, I had my other life. I was um, the editor-in-chief of Empire magazine and that was my day job and I hadn't written personal journalism for the first 10 years of my career because you know journalism is essentially telling other people's stories and when kind of confessional journalism came in in the you know late noughties I really resisted it because I was very conscious that I hadn't worked through the stuff well enough to be able to actually write about it in public view and I didn't want to be known for that, quite honestly. I wanted to develop a reputation that wasn't built on my personal kind of tragedies, I suppose, in some respects. And it's always been really important to me, since the book came out, that I keep that other side of, of my writing. So, you know, I, I write about film and culture, and um, I try and limit now the number of personal pieces I do, partly because I haven't got anything much, I just thought that I haven't got anything much to say, but you know, I, that book was everything I wanted to say, and it was the things that I really felt like I had to put on paper, and you know, somebody said to me, are you going to write a book about having a baby? Why? <laughs> like, having a baby is a really common thing, and loads of people have done it, and loads of people have written books about it, and columns about it, and how many times have we read that column by a man going, oh, my God, I had a baby. Here's a column about fatherhood. <laughs> um, I don't need to contribute to that. So I, 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 I'm thinking about another piece of nonfiction, but I don't think it will be anywhere near what I've done mm. so far. And I'm working on a, a novel, and my book has been bought for TV. So I'm, I'm kind of trying to move away from it a little bit because, exactly as Cash said, you will, your phone will ring and somebody will say, can you come on and talk about poverty or can you come on and talk about sexual violence? And there are moments when I think your voice is important and then there are moments when you need to know that your voice isn't important mm. and it isn't the right moment and you don't want to be speaking on behalf of, mm. of all women. Um, so I think you have to know where and when to insert yourself and, and when to stop. Mm. One of the really powerful things sitting here and, and feeling your spirit through the, through the waves, Cash, is 
the power of female friendship and female connection and this kind of, you know, this bond that the, that the two of you have, um, even though we're not together physically in the room, it feels tangible. And I wondered if either of you wanted to say anything about that, about the, the kind of the, the solidarity of female connection and whether some of that has sort of surprised you in, in this way. Well, I think I always feel connected to um, female working class storytellers because there's so few of us. And there is, you're ultimately gonna have that shared connection, even if your stories are completely different because you're in a unique position of being able to tell them and you see the strength and vulnerability that that brings. Um, so when I, you know, when I read Terry's book, you know, I, I, I was saying to her earlier that there were certain points and I'm, I'm quite, I, I, quite I, I like horrific things. I, I like seeing horrific things, reading about horrific things, but, there were certain points in Terry's book where I just had to look away from the page because I cared about the woman so much. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think, yeah, there is a solidarity between working class women when we share our stories. Am I right or not? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just sat here shaking my head. No, but it is because there, there is so few of us and that, you know, that's why I contacted Cash in the first place because I couldn't believe what I was fucking reading in a book that was published by Penguin. Like, it, it's still extraordinary that these stories are being told, and I think that in and of itself is extraordinary. Um, and, you know, I think I certainly have always... Oh, somebody is having a lovely time outside. I, I don't know if you can hear the dulcet tones of Bristol men <laughs> singing Sweet Caroline Cash from, um, from the think, Zoom call. I think they that... agree with us on female solidarity. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, and I, th I think, um, you know, men weren't always the most positive influence in, in my life growing up and in my early adulthood, and I've always relied on um, the power of female relationships to feel safe um, and to feel visible, really. Mm. And Cash, you just talked about that, the shift that you've now made into, into television writing, where actually there, it feels as though there's, there's more of an appetite for w women's working class stories and you feel free to tell them. Why, why is that? And what does publishing need to do to catch up? Well, I think, I think to see, TV is a very middle class um, forum. I think they have a lot of guilt. <laughs> so they're <laughs> opening the doors and letting us in. Um, but yeah, I mean, publishing is, I think it's just so snobby. And there's just, I, yeah, I, I think they don't really care. But well, the difference is, is that in, in TV, um, there's lots of money thrown, thrown around because people want to make interesting content. But in publishing, that same money isn't around. And big money only goes to um, writers who've been around for a long time. You know, and when I think about what I got paid for Skin Estate, I mean, it's absolutely disgusting. I mean, I've made a total of six grand, I'll, I'll happily be open about what I earn from Skin Estate, six thousand pounds after paying my agent's fee and the legal read, you have to pay for the legal read out of your money. And if you think about the way that that's paid over four payments um, over a two year period, um, you know, that's, that's no way to live. And if you're thinking about, and you're, and you're giving that money to someone who's writing about living in dire poverty. <laughs> I mean, it's just like the biggest insult ever. So who can afford to even work in publishing apart from the very wealthy anyway? But with television, you're paid for every little thing you do. Every, every time you have an idea and, it's, and someone is interested in that idea, you'll get paid for that. So that's, I mean, that's the way you treat writers, isn't it? You pay them, pay them well. And that's why publishing doesn't work for working class writers because there's just not the money. They're not willing to pay for those stories. And because they know that you're desperate, because they know that someone like me will go, oh yes, please, yes, because it's on Penguin, I want to, I'll take that, I'll take whatever you give me, and I'll give you whatever you want, and I'll come across as really sad to, to give you whatever, to, to sell that book, to do whatever you want me to do. Um, and that is why television is so much better, because they just treat writers better. Yeah, I mean, you really do have to be independently wealthy mm -hmm. to... No, I, don't, I, don't, I know very few people who can actually make a full-time living out of 
writing books. I, I did this while I had an actual full-time job. There's no way I could have lived on that money. Well, maybe for like three weeks or mm. something. So you do have to be independently wealthy, which is exactly that. That's why there are so few working class voices. And the ones that are working class voices are now middle class voices who mm. can actually afford to write the book about when they were poor. Um, and I think TV, TV is... They are desperate to innovate in TV. They really want to push the boundaries about who gets to tell stories and how they get to tell them. Um, what's palatable on screen, what isn't palatable on screen. And I think TV is much more engaged with that in a healthy way. You know, I, I very strongly wanted to write a graphic book and um, I was very lucky in that my publisher, Canongate, was really up for that. They're a, an independent publisher. They're quite into boundary pushing, but most... Mainstream publishers, I'm sure, wouldn't touch it with a barge pole because it's got graphic descriptions of sexual abuse, it's got graphic depictions of physical abuse, of self-harm. And, you know, a, a lot of people found that very off-putting and it was seen as too risky. But it's like, you know, our job is to tell the truth mm -hmm. and is to try and tell... And to try and share and describe our experience in the best way possible because how can anybody have empathy with us and with what we've been through if you cannot describe it accurately people want to cut away people want to look away people don't want to sit and read in great detail about that stuff but you know i would say about sexual abuse it doesn't happen in metaphor when you have a flashback or when you have a memory trauma isn't you know some amorphous you know metaphor in your mind where it's all blurred edges and you see a man, you feel his touch, you smell what it smelled like at that point. That's what it's like to live through that thing. And it isn't my job to make that easier for you to read about. It's my job to commit that truth to paper and to tell the truth in as, as, as real a way as possible. And I think publishing still often struggles with that concept because it's less commercial, mm. quite honestly. And um, it's very challenging and very risky. Mm. And I think TV is strides and strides. Think about I May Destroy You, right? The way I May Destroy You depicted... Mm -hmm. I'm not going to do any spoilers in case somehow you haven't seen it, but um, the, the way they depicted that assault and then the impact of that trauma, mm -hmm. the, the surrealism employed in it is just ast absolutely astonishing. It's the closest depiction I've seen to what it actually feels like. And that kind of boundary pushing and, and real kind of innovation in telly I don't think we've seen yet in publishing. What do you think it will take in order to get to that point of innovation in publishing? I'll tell you what, it'll, it'll take somebody like selling Matt Haig kind of book numbers with a book like that, which is never going to happen. That's the thing is mm. publishing follows the money, right? Mm. So there needs to be a number one bestseller and then, and then suddenly everybody will want that book. But that's, I just don't think that's going to happen. And that's why of people who work in publishing have a very narrow view of what it is to be working class as well. Yeah. So um, they're only seeing the surface stories. They're not they're not thinking about the bigger stories in the way that television does, in the way that TV producers kind of have to keep their eye on the ball. They have to see what's going on out there in the real world. Publishing is very enclosed. So I think until the publishing industry is packed full of working class people who actually work for the publishing houses, then there's no, there's no way that a broad spectrum of working class stories will be available. Because I think we should say as well, we're talking about very specific stories. And my book is quite sad, I have to say. Like, um, there aren't many jokes in it. But the, the spectrum of working class experience, you know, it, it isn't all pain and tragedy and trauma and misery. Working class communities are full of love and joy and connection and community. And it's about showing that whole spectrum mm. of experience, not just this, which is which could be in some respects voyeurism, you know. Mm. Oh, let's go and look at how the other half live and how awful it is. Well, actually, what about books that celebrate what it is to be working class as well? And I don't think you we really get that spectrum mm. at no. all at the moment. Again, that was something that came up. We had a session earlier with um, some Swedish writers, and one of the um, questions from the audience there was, who do you think the audience is for your working-class um, material that they were writing? And they, they said, 
unfortunately, it's middle class writers being voyeuristic. Mm. Um, and, uh, and of course, we want to be writing uh, for people like us. And it's so powerful then when you do find that person who finds themselves reflected in it. But actually, it is that voyeurism and the commercialization is the thing that's leading motivations and decision makers and, mm. and is leading the, the money. And all of a sudden, your authentic craft the work that you have toiled and crafted over becomes somebody else's product. And Cash, you talked earlier on about you know having to go onto BBC um, uh, Breakfast and you know promote the book. And actually, that even that sort of feels as though it it jars slightly somehow. I think I think you should you should promote your work. And I think yeah, I, th I think all artists should get out there and and speak about their work. And if you can get on BBC Breakfast News to do it, then you're reaching a, a wide audience. But it's the kind of questions that you're asked once you're on that platform. So uh, a middle class author would go on and they would talk about their book and they may talk about the craft of writing and they may talk about what brought them to that point of written a moment, what brought them to that point. But they would be considered a writer, I think, first and foremost. But I've always found, um, not tonight, but in in situations like this, where I've been asked to kind of say, you know, what was the worst thing that happened to you when you were poor? How much money were you really living on? You know, how sad, you know, just how sad were you? And um, it's about the approach rather than actually promoting the work. I think I, th I think promoting your work is a really good thing. Because otherwise no one's going to hear of it, right? Like... No one, you know, these, we write these books so that they're read. We tell these stories so that people understand them. So, yeah, get it out to a wide audience. But once you're on that platform, you need to be treated equally to every other writer who's, who's out there. Yeah, I went on um, Loose Women and, I know, <laughs> honestly, and I'd been like, oh, I really want the book to be seen as literary. And then my publicist rang up and went, um, they want you to go in Loose Women. And I was like... Oh my God, my nanny used to love Loose Women. And then, and part of me was like, oh, I can't go on something like Loose Women because it's not the right, it's not the right environment for, for my book. And then I thought, it's a massive platform mm. that reaches loads of people. And actually, to be fair, the Loose Women, I can't remember which ones they were, but the Loose Women actually had really sensitive questions um, and were really considerate, uh, much more so than some of the broadcast interviews mm. I did. Um, but I was like, actually, if I've, got a, if I've got a platform to be able to talk about this kind of thing to millions of people instead of thousands of people, then I, you know, maybe that's something I should, I should take. And all you try and hope is that it gets, the message gets through in a close, as close a way as you can hope in terms of what you really want the book to say and what you really want it to say about you as a writer. And you can't control that once it's out in the world, people will present it how they how they want to um, but I'm with cash I think you have to take those mm. opportunities and just hope that you're treated fairly mm. and Terry, I saw that interview, Sorry, Terry and it was um, as far as loose women goes you were actually treated like a literary sensation to be honest like you you weren't treated like you know someone who's there to tell their sad story you were I, you were you were treated great I thought it was as far as loose women goes yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah within that context yeah <laughs> Um, questions from anyone? I'm going to keep batting it out just in case people have got things to say. Also, because we've only got a few minutes left. Yes, lady over here. Hiya. Um, thanks so much for everything you've been speaking about. It's like a fire lit under my arse, if I can be frank, because... Um, you just, you just don't get to be in these spaces and speak frankly like this and listen to people in this way, I don't find. Um, so Terry was saying something about um, trauma being with you and living with it and living alongside it. And um, I've been really thinking about how specifically writing changes the way trauma feels in your brain and your body and how like that process, what it does to it. Um, because it it's never it never goes it's always there. But what so I wanted to ask both of you personally what di what did you what do you find when you when you've written so openly about traumatic experiences? 
what does the actual process of like sequencing them and getting them out of you and onto the page, if if it if that does something noticeable, what how would you describe that change and what that does for you? Um, well, when I first was writing it, as I say, it it wasn't intentional or strategic at all. It it kind of was demanding to be written, really, and I just went with it. And I didn't. Um, I usually write by writing a bit editing it, rewriting it, and I can't, I'm a bit obsessive and I can't move on to the next paragraph until that one's perfect. With this one, I just threw it out the window and wrote everything, stream of consciousness, um, page after page after page, and then came back to it. I found, because people always ask, oh, was it cathartic? Was, did it help? And I think what I found was the process of writing it, because I was revisiting stuff I hadn't thought about you know, in years, I deliberately kind of buried that stuff under six feet of dirt and then six feet more. And unearthing it and really digging into it um, was in, an incredibly painful process, I have to say. I had to do it in, like, a few hour slots and then walk away and then come back to it. Um, and, yeah, that was, that was really difficult. But I have to say, and I didn't feel better about it for some time, and then you, went, and then you give your book to your editor... They come back with edits on the most painful and awful thing that's ever happened to you, and they're asking about the repetition of this verb. And I was like, felt incredible. That I found that incredibly difficult. Because you're handing that bit over. The bit where it felt better to me was actually when the book came out. So I was incredibly nervous and and was felt incredibly exposed, like Cash said, especially about revealing all of that stuff. And I felt there was a period definitely where I felt like I just pulled the scab off the top of the trauma and I'd just reopened the wound and I wondered if I'd done the wrong thing. And then when the book came out, I can't even describe it. It just felt like I'd cut something out of me. And it, it you know, it's always something I'm going to find difficult. It, you know, and things make it newly difficult. Having my son made it newly difficult becoming a mum. And but I can manage it much better now, and I do feel like rather than it suffocating me, I used to feel buried underneath it, and now I feel like it just sits alongside me, and sometimes it appears, and I have to work on putting it back down, um, but it doesn't overwhelm me, and it doesn't kind of cut off my air supply anymore, and I think a massive, massive part of that is writing the book, and I, I never thought I'd say that, but I still, you know, 18 months on, 16 months on from the book being published, I still absolutely feel like that. I found for me, like, it, it was, it became, like, quite easy to write, because I think I was in so much trauma at the situation I was living in, that I was able to disassociate from it totally, so I would get up and I would write, and it was almost like, I was writing something else, something, someone who lived within, who lived within me that I didn't have to deal with. So it kind of flowed out quite easily in that respect. And now looking back on it, I, I can't even believe that that was me. <laughs> so when I read it now, it's like I'm reading someone else's story and, um, or, or certain bits I'll read and I'm just like, oh God, can't believe I can't believe I thought that that was a thing that someone should tell tell as part of their story in a book so I think when you're looking at the, 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 the situation you had Terry when you had the um the freedom of hindsight mm. um, and I imagine that's probably actually more traumatic because you're looking back and digging into your past whereas if you're actually in the moment then you can almost switch off and kind of write through the mental illness which I think it's, it's, it's nice to be able to kind of let go of that now, but it really leads to something powerful at the time, doesn't it? It's, it can become quite powerful to kind of throw yourself into that mental situation. I hope that was helpful because I understand, I, like when I, I used to go to things like this and I'd ask questions and I'd, I'd like, yeah, I just, I hope, I hope that that makes sense to you. Um, yeah, another question here at the front. Hello, um, nice to see you both. Um, I've not quite articulated this in my head yet, but I just wanted to ask how do you guys feel about the kind of surge of uh, middle-class white women writing lots of books at the moment, <laughs> i.e. Dolly Alderton, Pandora Sykes types that we all love, 
how does that fit alongside your kind of genre and um, in within you sort of mentioned it within publishing. Um, everybody loves kind of exploitative working class story, and I feel like it's sort of yeah. How does it fit alongside these big books that are coming out right now and this you know Dolly all that kind of popularity? Sorry, I've not said that well, but do you understand what I'm <laughs> yeah. saying? Cash, do you want to take this one? No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, and I, I've got Dolly's blurb to my book, so I'm just going to point that out. And, and I, I really like both Pandora and Dolly. Um, so this isn't about them, but, but I suppose what I would say is, because I think, you know, women being published generally is a brilliant thing, especially young women, because, again, young female especially fiction writers have long been dismissed as trivial and having nothing to say, and that's always slightly pissed me off. But um, I, think, I think there is still not enough room for working-class women, for women of colour. I think that the publishing industry is trying to do more about diversity and inclusion and representation. Um, I don't think if you look at kind of titles being released and, and the ones that are charting really high, I'm not sure how much the house is in order at the moment. Um, but I don't, I don't want to criticise those women because I think... But I, I know what you're saying. You're talking about the industry, right? And, and yeah. the people who get book deals versus... Especially probably very healthy book deals versus people who don't. Well, I don't think we do. F I don't think we do fit. Yeah. I don't think we fit within uh, any of that. I certainly don't feel like I fit within any kind of literary scene or anything like that. Um, uh, I feel like I'm kind of a not a, a token working class person, but kind of sort of a token working class person in some of those conversations. Um, I think I was quite lucky in that there was support for my book because. I'm a journalist and I know the journalists and they know my story. Um, uh, but I think, yeah, I, I don't see myself as, as sitting within that. And I think when I first got my book published, I kind of wanted to be, because I was like, you know, those women are all really successful and they're all doing really well. Um, but I, I don't think my, my particular style and what I write and what I produce um, really sits within that very easily. I have nothing to say about it. I, I just, I just find it. Um, we just hear the same voices again and again and again, and I find it incredibly dull. Yeah. <laughs> Is that a clap? Yeah. <laughs> nice. <laughs> uh, I think we've got time for one more question. Is there a last question? Yes, stand here at the front. Thank you. Thank you. Um, on that note, apart from each other's, what women's working class art or writers and stuff at the moment would you recommend? Because it is it still feels like you have to dig this stuff out and find it. And is there anybody you're reading at the moment or historically that you'd recommend to us all? Oh God, that's a really good question. I feel like I'm being tested now. Shit. Well, I, I really love um, the work of Annie Siddons. Mm. I adore her. I think, I think she's one of the finest playwrights this country has and she's like overlooked horrendously because she's a woman in her 50s and she's working class um, so I would like really recommend checking out her plays she did um, and you, you can buy them I think they're with Nick Hearn books um, How Not to Live in Suburbia and Dennis of Penn. I mean, she's just wild. She just writes these really like true heartfelt stories of what it is to be a working class woman, but she also does it in a really entertaining, wild way. So I'd recommend her. And also I really love um, Libby Libbard, who's also a playwright, um, theatre maker, who just makes extraordinary stories about what it is to be a single mum. Nothing cliche about her at all, but again, really entertaining. So I'd, yeah, I'd recommend those two. Oh, I think she was here. Um, Emma, Emma Glass. No, do I mean Glass? Yes. Yeah. Glass yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go, Sasha yeah. Noon, Natasha. Yeah. So I adored Peach. I think Peach is just like an incredible book. Um, and Graham, um, 
I've suddenly turned into a nana who can't remember anybody's name. <laughs> but Graeme Armstrong, I want to say, the Scottish... Oh, uh, yes, so writer. good. So, yeah, so good. He's incredible. This is also a good point to uh, plug Storysmith, who are outside and have a fantastic um, display of all sorts of writers, a lot of whom have been here over the last couple of days and will be here tomorrow. And also, if you use the um, code uh, CLASSFEST, you get 10% off, not just outside, but also um, online as well. Um, and nice to be supporting an independent bookshop, but also making sure that uh, writers get paid for the work that they have done as well. So do, do support in that way. Um, I can't believe that we're out of time. Um, um, already. Um, Cash, thank you so much for being here and actually for inviting us into your house as well. Um, oh, thank you. Thank, thank you, thank you so, so much. I was going to say, it looks like the fire's, the fire's gone out, gonna... so I hope you're not uh, too cold. <laughs> I'm good. I've got a fever, I've got COVID, I'm dying here. <laughs> um, thank you so much for, for joining us, particularly, as you say, with, um, with, with being poorly, and we hope that you get well soon and feel better soon and thank you so much for making the effort to join us over zoom in these thank odd you. And sorry times. to cause you so much trouble thank you um uh, thank you so much everyone for being here do um come and join us back again um tomorrow do feel free to um to stay stay around in watershed afterwards to continue to connect to continue to have conversations um but most importantly thank you so much to cash and terry if we can all show up <laughs> Thanks, Cash. We're going, to t we're going to turn the Zoom off now, so we're going to wave oh, goodbye hey. to you. Bye. Nice to see you all. Bye. Take care. See ya. <laughs> <laughs>